So far, we have seen how the increase in food prices over the last few years has dramatically increased the portion of the world population that is undernourished and in poverty. We've already touched on a few reasons as to the cause of this problem, including rising fuel prices. However, this issue is far more complicated than just our dependency on fossil fuels. Next, I will discuss some of the many challenges we must overcome in order for the global community to produce a sufficient supply of safe, nutritious, and sustainable food. The first challenge is human population. Over the last two, three hundred years, we have seen the human population skyrocket. From about one billion in the mid-1800s to 2.5 billion in the early 1950s to the mid-6 billion in the uh, late 2000s, and this number could continue to go up to about 9.2 billion in 2050. This is an increase of about 2.5 people per second, or 80 million people per year. With this increase in the human population will come an increased need for food. Now if we look at over the last 60 years, we have seen that with the increase in, in human population, we have even less land to produce food for that population. On this graph we have time on the x-axis, world population in billions on the y-axis to the left, and the amount of arable land in hectares per person on the right x-axis. In 1950, with a human population of around 2.5 billion people, we had about 0.5 hectares of land per person to produce food. Today, 2008-2009, human population is around 6.7 billion, and we have about 0.2 hectares of land per person to produce food. So more people to feed and less land uh, to feed them on. Again, with our projections of human population reaching upwards of 8 billion, by 2030, we could see the amount of land available, arable land available, uh, on a per person basis to drop down to 0.15 hectares. This means that we are going to need to produce more food in a smaller area of land in order to make sure that we have a stable food supply. Now the increase in demand has, has of course grown over the last uh, uh, 30, 50, 100 years. But the number is showing that what is estimated or predicted shows a huge jump in the demand. Between 2000, 2005, 2006 and 2015, it is estimated that we could see increases in the demand upwards of 2.5%, which is far more than about the 1.5% annual increases that we saw in the 1980s. Now, we have been increasing our supply on a yearly basis, however, not quite like how we used to in the 1960s and 70s. On this graph, we have the increase in supply for three grains, corn, wheat, and rice. And on the y-axis, we have the average annual increase in percent. As you can see, between 1967 and 1996, the increase in these grains was somewhere between 2 to 2.6 percent per year. More recently, since 1997, we have seen the increases in these grains range from about 0.8% upwards of about 1.5%. If we are going to keep up the demand, we're going to need to find a way to produce more food on a yearly basis, a percentage is greater than 1.5% that we see here. Now if we put the supply and demand uh, graphs together, we can get a, a, a picture of what's taken place over the last 40 uh, years or so. On the x-axis, we have time between 1965 and, and uh, 2015, and of course beyond 2008, uh, 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 these are uh, our estimates. And on the y-axis, we have yield and demand indexed to 1965. As you can see in the 1960s and early 1970s, there was plenty of, of supply to keep up with demand. Now if you look at since 1970s, this has not quite been the case. In the 1960s we had the dawn of the Green Revolution, brought about in part uh, to Norman Borlaug's miracle uh, wheat uh, variety, which was a um, drought tolerant, uh, disease uh, resistant dwarf wheat variety that allowed countries such as Mexico, uh, in, uh, Pakistan, India to go from being major wheat importers to being able to produce a sufficient or almost sufficient supply 
of wheat. In some cases, these countries were able to actually start exporting uh, wheat. But since then, uh, we, we've seen that um, in order to keep up with demand, we've had to rely heavily on input intensive agriculture and more specifically in input intensive monoculture. Now some may argue that we do produce enough food on a yearly basis to feed the, the world and that the problem is simply uh, distribution and access. And this would definitely be a, a legitimate um, uh, issue to debate and to look uh, further into. But we are going to be facing in, in the coming years uh, instances where the supply does not keep up with the with the demand. Uh, in particular, uh, if you notice here in some of the projections, there's a huge discrepancy between the supply of of, uh, of food and the demand that we have for it. Now, in 1998, uh, the world uh, stockpile of grain was about 115 day supply. Now, in 2008, at the height of this food crisis when we did see um, some fluctuations in production that supply was down to about 60 to 70 days and in the future we can see that number to continue to go down as human population increases the amount of land that we have to produce food for that population um, either remains stable or actually continues to or, or decreases and we are going to be faced in the future with global shortages that may hit as far as the developed world including the uh, United States. So this is something you can to consider um, as I've discussed some of the other uh, contributing factors to the global food crisis. Now there are some other issues that definitely play a huge role um, in this uh, uh, issue with the uh, supply and demand um, in the global food crisis and I won't be going into great detail in the interest of time. Uh, one of them, and, and this is a significant one, are farm subsidies. Uh, the United States and many countries in, in Europe, uh, basically a lot of the OECD countries, uh, have food subsidies which can greatly drive down uh, the cost of grain, particularly for example uh, corn. Uh, again, this comes back to a point I mentioned earlier in that uh, for Americans, a lot of what we pay for in our food is what happens after harvest. Um, it's the processing um, of the food into you know the, the cereal that we may eat in the morning to the uh, frozen pizza or TV dinner that we may pull out of the freezer. Uh, we're paying for the processing and not so much or not near as much for the actual uh, raw components uh, uh, of that meal like we used to. So food uh, subsidies are definitely a factor that impacts the supply and demand and overall uh, the price uh, of our food. Another one is import depend dependence. A number of countries, including for example Saudi Arabia, are heavily import dependent because you know, due in large part to their climate uh, or other environmental conditions such as the, the soil quality and water resources they have available, they are not able to produce near enough food to meet the uh, uh, the demand for uh, uh, their population. Uh, so this has some unique impacts on global supply and uh, demand of food. The final um, uh, example here is, is hoarding. Uh, some countries like for example India and China recently have dramatically cut down on their exports due to fears of food, global food shortages and a need obviously to supply enough food for, for their uh, uh, population. Now one messy aspect of this hoarding has been what's known as land grabbing and the United States is one of the countries that um, um, not they're not necessarily land grabbers but they have purchased land in other countries uh, well actually I should say purchase or lease land in other countries uh, for agriculture. Uh, a good example of this is uh, a relationship between Saudi Arabia and Ethiopia. Recently, uh, Saudi, uh, um, uh, in, well, recently, some Saudi investors spent more than $100 million to lease land in Ethiopia to produce wheat, barley, and rice. And the deal they, they've uh, struck with the Ethiopian government is that for the first several years, there will be no taxes um, on the land or on the harvest, and that they have the ability to export the entire harvest uh, 
back to Saudi Arabia. Now, at the same time that the Saudi investors are spending, again, upwards of around $100 million, the World Food Program has been spending almost the same amount, about $116 million, to provide food aid to those suffering in uh, this country, uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, so, you know, this is something that just doesn't quite make sense. Um, and as you can see on, on, on this map, the countries in green have either sold or leased land to uh, countries, particularly those um, in the uh, uh, lighter uh, um, greenish gray color uh, that you see uh, on this map. Um, of the countries that have been have had the huge, uh, largest impact is particularly has been China and South Korea. Uh, between 2006 and 2009, China has either purchased or leased or uh, obtained the ability to uh, uh, farm more than 2.8 million hectares of land. Uh, South uh, Korea is uh, closer to around 800,000 uh, million, uh, I'm sorry, 800,000 hectares um, of land. Uh, so this is something that we're going to see um, increasing in the future and is something that the global community um, is certainly going to need to uh, respond to. Now one of the uh, impacts on uh, supply uh, and demand and ultimately price um, is meat production. Um, on this graph we have time between 1960 and, and 2006 and on the y-axis we have millions of tons of uh, meat produced for beef and buffalo, uh, pig and poultry. And these are in the developing portions of the world. So as you can see over the last uh, 40 years, the, the meat production uh, in the developing countries has increased quite a bit. Um, between 1982 and 1993, uh, production has increased about 53%. And in 1995, we've reached a point where the developing world actually produces more meat than the industrialized and developed uh, uh, countries. Um, and so this is, is quite a, a, a shift in um, in food production and meat production is well meat in general is a very inefficient method uh, for nutrition for example if we look at the grain that's needed to feed um, uh, animals uh, particularly to produce uh, beef and pork uh, you'll notice that, uh, that on this graph we have on the x-axis grain required in kilograms to produce one kilogram of protein in the y-axis we have some different uh, products including milk, eggs, and then uh, chicken, pork, and beef. And beef is uh, a very inefficient method of, of nutrition, but again is, is a, a food staple that uh, a large portion of the world uh, enjoys. Um, 20 kilograms of grain is required to produce one kilogram of, of protein. So again this is highly inefficient. So in these developed, uh, developing uh, countries in the world where they are having a hard time producing food, they're spending an enormous amount of resources uh, on producing meat uh, and perhaps instead of producing uh, grain for uh, consumption. In addition to grain, the amount of land required is quite large. Um, again, for beef, uh, you're looking at upwards of around 250 square meters to produce one kilogram of protein. And this is again, of course, when animals um, are grazing. Uh, in the United States, of course, we have um, uh, compact uh, uh, feed operations uh, where we see lots of animals uh, confined to small spaces, um, pretty much just for the purpose of uh, uh, growing, developing, and then ultimately slaughtering uh, for human consumption. This is a uh, feedlot operation with more than 100,000 um, um, animals uh, in California. And so obviously in these circumstances, they don't need 250 square meters um, to produce one kilogram of, of protein. But this type of agriculture has in it its, its own inherent problems um, that we, uh, you know, it, it, it's something for a, a different uh, discussion. After grain and land, water is another component uh, to this uh, equation with meat production. Um, 
and again with beef again very uh, input uh, intensive um, upwards of uh, 750 uh, kilograms of water required to produce one kilogram of protein and again in the developing countries uh, some of these countries have uh, uh, so, some severe water uh, supply issues and so um, where they've had a struggle with between you know, providing water for agriculture and providing, uh, providing water for uh, human consumption. So meat production is one aspect of this uh, problem, one challenge that we are uh, facing. And again, um, uh, meat production is, is expected to continue to increase uh, to large, uh, significantly large uh, levels in the coming years as the demand continues to uh, increase uh, for meat, particularly in, uh, in China. Now another aspect of, uh, of agriculture that has a huge uh, impact on uh, our current global uh, food system and some of the problems that we are facing is in input intensive farming, uh, basically monoculture farming, uh, a system of agriculture that we uh, have extensively throughout the United States. In this type of agriculture, um, fossil fuel resources are a critical part of the equation. And again, a large reason as to why food prices went up quite uh, heavily uh, in 2008 with the increase in uh, petroleum. Now the fossil fuel resources are required in part one to provide uh, fertilizers, uh, pesticides and other agricultural chemicals. A lot of these are petroleum based. Um, and then you have uh, seed and water, um, everything, everything from packaging to transport of uh, in some cases all four of these components um, uh, you know, to the to the farmer, and then uh, eventually um, harvesting as well. So these are all the purchase inputs that we have um, for farming. And a again, this this requires a huge amount of energy, particularly in the form of fossil fuel uh, resources. Now, additionally, fossil fuel resources obviously are needed to power the machines that we have on these farms. Everything from your tractors to combines and um, other farming equipment and so these uh, machines are used to for example for fertilization, seeding, tillage, um, or irrigation and finally uh, pest control and these are all part of the equation that, that we have in our modern farm production uh, system. Um, now of course uh, during farm during plant production solar energy plays a huge role in this and natural precipitation and levels of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, which again is required for photosynthesis to to occur these all play a huge role but what we've seen over the last uh, 50 plus years is that the Sun's role in our agricultural system is, is decreased in just because of the huge need for fossil fuel resources uh, obviously we still need uh, solar energy to grow food but we're relying heavily now on additional uh, resources beyond just solar energy. And after all this, in the end, we have harvest and storage, and we have our final product. Now, just like with meat uh, production, which was heavily input intensive, this uh, monoculture form of farming is also heavily input uh, intensive. Um, for example, uh, because the plants uh, and crops are grown so close together, um, and only you know we have fields and fields, acres and acres of just one crop, there's a huge need for pesticides to keep the pest populations, uh, whether it's weeds or uh, insects, um, under control. So this is another part that uh, uh, has been a contributing factor to um, high prices and in parts too to some. Uh, global food shortages because when uh, you know sufficient nutrients are not there if pesticides are not effective then that has a huge impact on um, on farm production another aspect of this equation is biofuels now um, we've seen a, a big push recently for uh, uh, corn based ethanol um, to produce biofuels uh, in the United States and, and elsewhere in the world. And this is something that's had some an initiative that's good intentions, but unfortunately uh, not completely uh, well thought out. 
um, it takes about 110 gallons of gasoline to produce one acre of corn and as this uh, editorial cartoon demonstrates that although biofuel is uh, more environmentally friendly than uh, uh, burning gasoline uh, traditional gasoline uh, the amount of fossil fuels needed to produce the corn that's eventually made into ethanol almost balances out any benefit we gain um, from using that ethanol corn based ethanol biofuel uh, so this is something that in, again in the future and we've already seen some some calls to action for looking at alternative ways of producing biofuels uh, for example whether it's through sugarcane or algae um, instead of having to rely on um, corn uh, based ethanol now if we look at the portion of the US uh, uh, corn uh, supply uh, we've seen that in uh, 2008 almost a third of our corn non export corn supply goes towards ethanol production um, feed of course is the the highest uh, uh, allocation of our uh, of our corn production about 55 percent of our corn um, again non export corn goes to feed and only a very small percentage um, and it's part of that four percent um, that was the field corn surplus alcohol sweet corn and seed only a small percentage actually goes to corn that you know you may go to the supermarket and actually buy um, after after ethanol uh, high fructose corn syrup uh, five percent of the corn production goes to uh, this product which is something that is uh, heavily found in almost every food you purchase at the grocery store whether it's um, again your, your corn flakes or soda uh, ice cream uh, juices um, you name it if you look at the, the label and the ingredients you'll probably find high fructose corn um, corn syrup now recently um, uh, in May 2008 the USDA chief economist testified before a joint economic committee that 70% of the uh, corn prices and 40% of the soybean prices were due in part to biofuel production. Um, now there have been there's been quite a bit of controversy as to these numbers. Uh, some estimates showing that the impact is much less than that, around 3%. Um, however, I think it's safe to say that uh, corn-based ethanol is definitely having an impact on uh, corn prices um, not only in the United States but globally um, and this is an issue that could continue to uh, uh, worsen or play a heavier factor in the uh, in food prices um, at the end of the the, the recent Bush administration uh, legislation was passed to um, assure an increase in uh, production of corn based ethanol upwards of about uh, 500 percent by the year 2022 uh, so this is something that we'll definitely need to really take a close look at and uh, and re-examine before we continue to um, uh, move on in in this direction now in addition to biofuels global climate change is also having an impact on our uh, food supply and perhaps with with the recent uh, uh, food crisis has particularly play, played a large role this image shows uh, some forecasts and estimates as to the impact of global climate change on agriculture. Uh, countries that you see in uh, dark green and light green, it's estimated that there could actually be an increase in agricultural output uh, by 2080. Countries that you see in, in yellow and red uh, could actually see a decrease in agricultural output uh, by 2080, due in part to droughts, um, more frequent flooding um, and just uh, more unpredictable um, patterns in our uh, weather and ultimately uh, climate. Now this assumes the areas where there's actually increases for example uh, the northern portion of the United States and into Canada um, and, and parts of uh, Europe and China um, and the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union is assuming that increases in CO2 will lead to an increase in production and keep in mind this will not occur if crops lack proper water uh, proper soil and um, 
uh, and other uh, uh, resources. So this is a, a big if, um, you know, and, and this is not something that we should bank on that global climate change will be actually good for us in terms of producing more food. Because again, as you can see, a good portion of the world would actually see its agricultural system suffer um, if, if this continued. Uh, on this next uh, map, we see the countries that have been, uh, that had to deal with uh, uh, drought and flooding uh, over the last couple years. Um, for example, in India, um, India has dealt with some issues with drought and they could see a 40% decline in productivity by 2080 um, if the, the current heat waves and, and droughts that they've had continue to destroy their re growing uh, regions. Uh, in Africa, and, and, and this is an interesting uh, image from, uh, from NASA, uh, what we're seeing here is the areas in green are areas where the vegetation is particularly more dense than normal. And areas that we see in red are areas where the vegetation is more sparse um, uh, than, uh, than, than, than what is typical. And as you can see, this, uh, this map focuses mostly on sub-Saharan Africa. And in that mid region, uh, in particular, we we have uh, had deal have to, had to deal with quite a bit of, of drought recently, and um, Africa could see a 30% decline uh, in its productivity by uh, 2080, um, and uh, Senegal and Sudan could experience a complete collapse of their agricultural system if these declines reach as high as 50% um, over the next 60, 70, 70 years. Now Australia is a particularly interesting um, example of the impacts of global climate change and drought. Um, as you can see in, in the same uh, type of image uh, from NASA with again the areas in red, areas where vegetation is more sparse uh, than normal. If we look at the southeast portion of Australia, which is the Murray-Darling Basin, which is responsible for a huge portion of their rice and wheat uh, production they have experienced uh, some significant problems um, and reductions in their agricultural uh, production. Their rice uh, crop has decreased by 98% over the last eight years, has pretty much for the most part completely collapsed. Uh, wheat production has dropped from 28 million tons to around approximately 10 million tons. Now with this in decrease in their rice production, um, there's actually been an increase in the production of grapes for producing wine, uh, in part because of the climatic conditions um, uh, needed for rice compared to um, uh, grapes. And they call this the, um, the Chardonnay effect, uh, this significant increase in uh, grape production for wine and the uh, complete uh, almost collapse of their rice production. And again, this is due in part due to the significant droughts that have hit Australia, particularly in the early, uh, you know, between 2000, 2005, 2006, there was a bump up. Uh, there was sort of a, uh, the drought sort of eased uh, a bit and they did see more rain. But then since then, again, they've been um, hit hard with, with drought. Now, Australia, um, uh, up before the, this uh, drop in rice production occurred, um, export a significant amount of their rice to the uh, Middle East and, and Asia and, and Pacific uh, regions um, of the world and now this is less food that's being shipped to those parts uh, to those countries and as a result again for many of these countries is a reason why they have uh, in some cases started to hoard food or reduce their ex exports to make sure that they have enough food uh, for themselves. Um, continuing on after global climate change, we have soil fertility and degradation. Uh, this image uh, comes from a recent um, uh, article and special in National Geographic. And looking at this global map, the areas, um, uh, basically this is a map showing the relative levels of soil fertility that we have. Um, the darker the green, the more fertile the soils. and um, Notice, for example, in the United States, in the Midwest, uh, particularly parts of the Corn Belt, where we have some of the most fertile soils, uh, not only in the United States, but globally, 
um, in parts of Iowa, in Kansas, Nebraska, uh, for example. Um, and again, if we look at uh, Africa, Australia, we see some of the, the key regions that in terms of uh, that maintain the resources needed for their agricultural systems are the same regions that we saw previously have had to deal with drought and reductions in uh, food and grain production. Now, of all the land that you're seeing here, which again is, is some of the most fertile land um, that we have in, in globally, about a fourth of this land probably shouldn't be used because it's either sensitive to degradation, um, erosion, for example, um, and shouldn't be in production. But we we use it anyway, again, because we need to be able to produce uh, food to meet the growing demand and growing population. Now, soil degradation is, is a big issue that oftentimes does not get uh, much attention. And on this graph, we see the areas that are in red are areas that contain very degraded soils, and areas in white are, are more stable soils. Now, you'll notice that, you know, again, coming looking at the United States, that the portion of the United States that I just mentioned was the, some of the most fertile soil in the world is shown on here as, as being very degraded. And being degraded doesn't necessarily mean that it is soil that is no longer useful. It just means over time, the quality of that soil has degraded. And so again, although the uh, land in the um, uh, United States is very fertile, uh, we have degraded it quite a bit over the last 100 uh, plus years. And a good example of that, if you think back to the Kansas, uh, Kansas Dust Bowl, uh, where we saw drought uh, in farming practices such as uh, tillage practices lead to uh, huge amounts of uh, wind erosion. Now, uh, globally, we have seen uh, over the last 100 years uh, more than 1,900 or 1,900 million hectares of land have been degraded. Um, and currently we have about 1,500 million acres uh, under cultivation and uh, with about 3,000 million acres uh, used as rangeland and we have about perhaps you know the the 1500 million hectares that are uh, used uh, currently could expand upwards to around um, 2000 million um, uh, hectares that could produce good yields but again this is something that if, if we're not careful with how we maintain our soil resources um, we could see some significant problems with uh, with food production in the future now again, in some of the parts of the world where they have seen dramatic increases in population, such as parts of, of China and, and uh, uh, Asia and the Pacific, um, in China in particular, since 1957, and this is uh, according to the UN, um, between 1957 and 1996, 550 million hectares of, of land have been degraded, uh, farmland has been degraded. and to give you a, a sense of, of how much land this is, this is equal to all the farmland in Denmark, Germany, uh, France, and the Netherlands combined. A huge amount of, of land that has been uh, degraded. And so again, we will need to pay careful um, attention to our soil resources if we want to be able to continue to increase food production in the future. Uh, in Africa, we have seen 500 million hectares of land degraded since the 1950s. Uh, this is 65% of this region's agricultural um, agricultural land. In Latin and South America, uh, we have uh, seen 300 million hectares of land uh, degraded uh, over time. Uh, so, you know, again, I, I can't stress enough the importance of maintaining and caring for our soil resources. Now, these issues I've I've presented, and again, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the current global food crisis is a very complicated issue, but each one of these has played a significant part uh, to our current situation. And if we're not careful, to uh, definitely making the future situation uh, dire. Now, the question this brings up is: Are we approaching another food revolution? Uh, the last that we saw, again, the Green Revolution that was brought about by Norman Borlaug's hybrid wheat variety. Um, that allows us to increase uh, food production in, uh, uh, again, utilizing uh, less land and growing food in portions of the world that in the past had problems uh, growing.
growing wheat. And uh, this is something that former President uh, Clinton uh, in October 2008 uh, told a UN gathering that the global food crisis shows that, quote, we all blew it, uh, including me, by treating uh, food crops like uh, color TVs instead of as a vital commodity for the world's poor. Um, and Clinton makes a uh, former President Clinton makes an important point here, in that we definitely have to evaluate our uh, perspective, our view of food, uh, if we hope to address uh, this food crisis.